Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to continue discussing the production possibilities curve. In a previous video, we looked at the Russian Federation and its ability to allocate resources, being land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, towards the production of barley or wheat or a combination of the two, some barley or some wheat, as can be seen along this blue curve labeled the production possibility curve number one, the PPC number one. Um, now, one important note about the constant opportunity cost is the assumption that resources can be easily allocated or reallocated from the production of one good, in this case barley, towards the production of another good, in this case wheat. We are assuming that to produce wheat and barley, it re basically requires the same skills um, and production methods. Uh, water, planting seeds, harvesting, etc. Whether it's wheat or barley, the skills and methods needed are essentially the same. So because it's very easy to take labor on the land uh, and have them move away from barley towards wheat production, we see that the opportunity cost is constant, which is illustrated again in the data here. As we reduce the production of wheat by four units, the change being minus four, to gain an increase of, oh, I'm sorry, to, in order to increase the production of wheat from zero to four, which is a change of adding four units of wheat, we lose four units of barley. All right now, again, we see that the units are in millions of tons. We can simplify that to just um, increasing by four units uh, is where we sacrifice four units. So right here, we see the opportunity cost. What's the opportunity cost? of trying to produce an additional four units of wheat, we have lost the opportunity to produce four units of barley. And again, we see that as we increase the wheat production, as we produce another four units of wheat, the opportunity cost, we have lost the opportunity to produce four units of barley and so on. So we see the marginal changes here. To gain four units of wheat, we lose four units of barley. To gain an additional four units of wheat, we lose an additional four units of barley. And so the production possibility curve, again, illustrates the opportunity cost. We allocate our resources towards wheat production, which means that we must sacrifice some barley production. This ratio of gaining four units of wheat, at, uh, which sacrifices four units of barley, can be reduced to a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, this ratio can be anything. The, the constant opportunity cost can be a two-to-one ratio, a 10-to-one ratio, a 15-to-one ratio, and so on. Uh, as long as it's constant, as we produce from point A to point B to point C, as the ratio is the same, regardless of the quantity of output, then it is constant opportunity cost, all right, which is this straight blue line right here. All right, so hopefully that is clear. What else does the production possibly curve illustrate? It illustrates scarcity. So let's go over some of the applications of the model to illustrate different uh, economic concepts. So we're gonna quickly get rid of our, our notes here and just highlight again how the production possibility curve can illustrate several economic points. Number, number one, right? Or I should let's make a list here. We'll call these features of the production possibilities curve model. The first one we've already gone over, which is opportunity cost. All right, we can easily see what is sacrificed to gain four units of wheat? What do we sacrifice? We sacrifice barley. We've lost the opportunity to produce these four units of barley. So that's already been highlighted. The model also illustrates uh, choice. The Russian Federation 
looking at their land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship resources must make a choice as to where they would like to produce along their PPC curve. So if they decide to produce at point E, for example, where they're generating 16 million tons of wheat, that must mean that they can only produce 4 million tons of barley. So they have to make choices. Perhaps point E is what is desired by society. If it isn't, they may have to reallocate resources to perhaps point D. All right. So if they decide to choose to produce at point D, they will have to reduce wheat production from 16 million tons to 12 million tons in order to increase production of barley from 4 million to 8 million. So we can see how the model illustrates the choices that must be made by a society, a nation, or even an individual, a student deciding how they want to allocate their, their time towards studying or towards perhaps relaxing and socializing with friends, right? the choice that must be made. And that relates to the idea of trade-offs. Right? Trade-offs illustrate two choices that you can make. In order to choose one thing, you sacrifice the other choice. In order to produce barley or more barley, we sacrifice production of wheat. In order to spend time socializing with your friends and the use of your scarce time, you've sacrificed studying for IB exams, as an example. In addition, the uh, model illustrates scarcity. Scarcity is prevalent because we only have a finite or limited quantity of inputs. Our inputs are finite. All right, we only have a certain quantity of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. No more and no less. Okay, so since the inputs, the land, the labor, the capital, the entrepreneurship are finite, we can only produce a finite quantity of outputs, which is also finite. So we're taking all of our land, labor, and capital, and the blue curve, the production possibility curve, shows the maximum amount of outputs of wheat and barley that we can produce. And we cannot produce more than this as a result of the scarcity of our inputs or our land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Okay? Some other features, all right? Let's look at, is the assumption of the full employment of land, labor, capital, true in the world, real world? No, that is not the case. So in the real world, there is always going to be some unemployment of resources. We cannot fully employ all of our land, labor, and capital resources 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, for an entire year. There will be periods in time where they will be unemployed. So the assumption that we have the full employment of resources is not necessarily true. And we can also use the model to illustrate unemployed resources. And that will take us into the, the discussions of um, actual growth. Um, unemployment of resources, there will be some inefficiency in production, some type of inefficient production, right? or productive inefficiency, I should say. In the real world, there is some level of productive inefficiency where we're not always able to produce at minimum costs or costs at their lowest point, which we call in economics, economics, minimum average total costs. Or minimum ATC, right? This cannot always be attained. There's always gonna be some level of inefficiency in production. So where and how can we illustrate some level of unemployment or some levels of inefficiency? So let's go ahead and illustrate that. We're going to just get rid of some points here to make this a cleaner image. All right, so here I've cleaned up the uh, production possibilities curve to illustrate where we can feature unemployed resources. So essentially anything within below the production possibility curve highlights some level of unemployment. So let's take a look at 
a real world example. And we're going to move away from the Russian Federation example. And let's look at production, let's say, of wheat and barley again in Spain. All right, so we're going to look at production of wheat and barley in Spain. Okay. And if you look at the data, all right, looking at the um, CIA World Factbook, it shows that 4.2% of the Spanish labor force is involved in agriculture, 24% in industry, 71% in services. But uh, let's take a look at their unemployment rate. In 2019, it was estimated to be about 14.13%. As a result of COVID, it's around 15% of unemployed labor. And if we compare it to its neighboring, uh, a neighboring country, that of Andorra, we see that in Andorra, um, a, a smaller percentage of their populations involved in agriculture, just 0.5%. Most of their labor force is involved in the services sector. But look at their unemployment rate, 3.7%. 3.7% compared to Spain being at uh, 15%. So let's just round it down to about 15% and or we'll round it up to about 4%, okay? Um, so let's look, look at uh, production in Spain. Production in Spain, potentially, in the production of wheat and barley could be at this point. Let's label this point G, all right? This is ex an exaggeration, um, but it's highlighting that Spain is not fully employing all of their labor resources, so they're not producing the max amount of output that they potentially could produce. And that can be compared to, let's say, a country like Andorra. All right, Andorra at point H uh, has 4% unemployment, where Spain at point G has 15% unemployment. So here is that 4% unemployment in Andorra at point H whereas Spain has that 15% unemployment at point G, okay? Over time, if Spain finds uh, means to employ more of their labor resources, they make investments in education. Um, let's just assume that their labor force becomes stronger, able to easily access job opportunities, so they would achieve what we call actual growth. Spain would be moving from point G towards point H by reducing their unemployment from 15% to let's say 4% like Andorra, they'd be achieving actual growth, all right? That in actuality, in reality, they're employing more of their inputs, their labor resources, and able to generate more outputs of barley and wheat, for example, okay? So that's what we mean by actual growth. Is there an opportunity cost when Spain moves from point G to point H? In theory, no. They're taking advantage of their resources. They're employing more of their resources. So there's no opportunity cost incurred as they move from point G to point H. Okay. So that is our fifth feature of the model, which is illustrating actual growth. In actuality or in reality, no country is able to fully employ all their land, labor, and capital, so they're producing at some point beneath their PPC curve, let's say, for example, point G. And as, a, as they are able to employ more resources, they move towards point H, producing more of the barley and wheat outputs. Okay. A last feature of the model is growth in the production possibilities curve. Right, growth in production possibilities or growth in the PPC curve, basically meaning producing more outputs with the available inputs. So we're going to have to take a couple of notes, and this is important for those in macroeconomics. We're going to see this in macroeconomics, and when we get into international trade and development, this concept will appear again. So we wanna focus on this idea of achieving growth in the production possibilities curve, right? Growth in production possibilities. How is that achieved? Remember that the assumptions of the model is that we 
are holding things constant. We're assuming that the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship is all constant, right? So when we look at our resources, our inputs, our resources, which are it's another word for inputs, which is another word for factors of production, which we want to remember are number one, labor, two, land resources, that's our natural capital, three, capital or physical capital resources, things that do not occur naturally like machinery, things that are created by human beings as tools in their production process, and entrepreneurship. The, uh, the model assumes that these are constant, right? We're going to assume that the, make another note, the quantity, this is very important. We're assuming that the quantity of these resources is unchanging. We're assuming that the quality of these resources. In the previous video, we assumed that the labor working on the land to produce barley and wheat was low quality. And we're also assuming that the technology is not changing. So this is important for macroeconomics, micro and later in development. If we change, right, if we change the quantity, we change the quality, if we change technology, then we can cause a shift in the PPC curve. And we're going to assume that we can gain an increase in the quantity of resources. We're going to improve the quality of those resources and the technology is improving. If that is the case, then the PPC curve will shift outward, right, which we'll draw here. I'm going to label that PPC2. We're assuming that because we have increased the quantity of our labor, land, capital, or entrepreneurship resources, more inputs will lead to more outputs, thus the PPC curve will shift outwards. If we can improve the quality of our resources, if we take our labor resources and we improve the education, we make investments in their human capital, and they became higher skilled, they become more productive, um, and we will assume that will lead to the PPC curve shifting outwards. And technology, let's say that farmers are just using shovels on their farm, but then they acquire tractors. The tractor will allow them to produce more. So any change in the quantity, the quality, or the technology will lead to the PPC curve shifting. And we're assuming that in this case, it's shifting outward. Can they shift inward? Yes. If there's a decrease in the quantity, a decrease in the quality, or technology uh, somehow gets worse, then the PPC curve would actually be shifting in. Okay. In macroeconomics, we'll see later when we get to supply side policies, we'll have something called the long-run ag uh, aggregate supply curve, the LRAS curve, or the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, illustrating the potential amount of output produced in a country when we're measuring real GDP or final outputs produced on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis, that if we're able to change the quantity or improve the quantity, the quality, the technology, that will cause the LRAS curve to shift outward from LRAS1 to LRAS2, from YP1 to YP2, which is similar to the PPC shifting out from PPC1 to PPC2. So that needs to be clear, right? You're going to see this in macro and later in development economics, trying to uh, achieve increased supply of outputs through changing the quality, the quantity, or the technology of the resources within that nation. Okay, and that's it. So that's just kind of a wrap up of uh, the production possibilities curve. In the next videos, we'll be looking at uh, increasing opportunity costs versus constant opportunity costs. So that'll be in the next series of videos. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.